So you you can go to the bathroom if I go in. Okay, this is in my name tag. <laughs> your name. Oh, sorry. So your name is Sahari? Sahari. Just like it's spelled. Okay. All right, great. Thanks. All right, great. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, today we're uh, having Pitch Up's Supreme Court uh, series is ongoing, and they're do having uh, a lot of Supreme Court arguments during finals. So um, we have a, a small audience uh, here in, in person, but we're hoping online uh, presence is a lot greater. So uh, today was the case of Thrive Incorporated versus Click to Call Technologies. Um, and so I'll uh, let our panelists uh, get into a little more about uh, what the case is about. But first, let me introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, and to my left uh, is uh, Sarv Vishnub Hakat, right? Okay. Uh, he's a professor uh, at Texas A&M Law School. Um, he, before Texas A&M, he, he worked at the PTO, the Economist Office. Um, and he was a fellow at Duke and a postdoctoral associate at the Duke Center for Public Genomics. Um, to his left is Amy Saharia. She is uh, she focuses her, her practice on high stakes litigation at the Supreme Court and federal and state appellate courts around the country. She clerked for Just Justice Sotomayor on the U.S. Supreme Court from 2010 to 2011. To her left is Amanda Brulette. Amanda. Um, has a degree in physics, woohoo, I do too, um, and conducted several years of undergraduate research in optics field. She was a team, uh, part of the team that defended Cox Communications, litigation involving uh, photo photonic integrated circuits, and she graduated from Stanford Law School with pro bono distinction. And last but not least, um, we have on to the far left, uh, Igor uh, Timofeyev, close, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, he, he's a partner at Paul Hastings. Um, he is representing the PTAB, uh, who's also sponsoring today's uh, podcast. And so uh, with that, um, let, me, let me start by turning over um, the discussion. Um, first of all, we'll, we'll go to um, Amelia. Amanda. Uh, oh, Amanda, sorry. Uh, Amanda. Um, and she, hopefully Amanda can give us um, a sense of what the case was about today. Um, and uh, then we'll follow that up with Amy. They'll talk about what the case is about, the specific case. And then I'll turn to Sarab and Igor um, to tell us more about what the broader implications of the case are. And then we'll, we'll talk more about today. Thanks. Um, so the case we're dealing with here today, from a factual standpoint, back almost two decades ago, in the early 2000s, there was some litigation between two companies, rival companies, and the patent that was at issue in the case here was there was an allegation of infringement. Um, the litigation went on, eventually the two parties merged, and so the case was dismissed without prejudice. Um, now that patent came to be in the hands of click to call and so click to call sued what was at the time a Yellow Pages AT&T entity, um, which became Dex Media and then Thrive. But when they sued, um, it was, on that same patent and a, the, the, um, one of the two companies below that then merged was now part of this larger company. And so a predecessor in interest of the Yellow Pages AT&T entity had been sued for infringement of that patent more than a year before, but it was dismissed without prejudice. So um, the Yellow Pages AT&T entity filed an IPR less than a year after the complaint was filed against them Click to call, move to dismiss it. 
there was a large number of iterations up and down at the federal circuit um, appealing whether or not the IPR was time barred. Um, eventually, uh, the federal, the PTAB rejected that argument several times. Federal circuit rejected it a number of times, but eventually the outcome was the board said this patent is invalid. So now here we are today. And so for just a quick mention for anyone who's not familiar with IPRs that's in the room, um, there's a statute that says, so the IPR is a invalidity proceeding that takes place in front of the board rather than in district court litigation. And there is a provision that says, this is provision 314B that says you can't, sorry, 315B, which says you can't bring, you can't bring a petition for an IPR if you've been uh, served with a complaint in district court more than a year prior to your petition. Um, and so what the PTAB decided and what they had decided for years before is that if a complaint was dismissed without prejudice, the legal effect of that is as if it never existed. So therefore that complaint goes away. And so when the new complaint is filed against the um, Yellow Pages AT&T entity, it's a new case. They brought it within a year. Everything's fine, hunky-dory. IPR can proceed. Um, so again, after a series of appeals back up and down and a, a series of uh, precedents that changed a bit, um, we ended up here and the court agreed to hear not whether or not the earlier complaint could constitute a complaint under the time bar, but whether um, it was reviewable. Because there's a statute that's 314D that says the decision to institute an IPR shall not be reviewable. And so really the question presented here was whether or not the time bar constitutes a decision to institute. Great. It's complex, sorry. <laughs> Great. Uh, let me turn to Amy. I should mention um, that uh, Amy is not the actual respondent in this case. She's She filed amicus brief in support of respondent, but she has agreed uh, graciously uh, to play the role of respondent uh, in setting up the case at least. Um, so uh, let me turn over to her. Um, you can comment uh, on the case and really why you're um, uh, amicus, what your amicus brief adds to uh, the case. Sure. So um, I think uh, Amanda accurately described the, the facts of the case. One interesting twist to the case is that the PTO through the Solicitor General's office now agrees that the case was time barred. But the question is whether a, the court has jurisdiction to decide whether, in fact, the complaint was time barred. In other words, whether this reviewability bar applies merely to the decision, the, the kind of threshold decision that the PTAB needs to make before it institutes a proceeding is whether the um, petition, you know, plausibly states a claim uh, of patent invalidity. And, and so the question is, is that what is barred, that particular decision, or is it every decision that um, the PTAB needs to make in order to determine whether or not to institute an IPR? And one of those being the decision determination of whether or not the claim is time barred. So the petitioner's position is that uh, under no circumstances can a court ever determine whether the petition was time barred. Um, from, I filed an amicus brief on behalf of the Biotechnology Innovation Organization, which represents um, patent holders in the biotech space. And from our perspective, we think that the time bar is a critically important part of the statutory scheme. And uh, it is something that was part of the protections that Congress put in place for patent holders. And that uh, the better reading of the statute, or at least the statute is sufficiently ambiguous, that it should not be read to strip patent holders of their right to challenge um, in court the federal, uh, the PTAB's determination of the time bar issues, particularly where that's, uh, it sets out the, the PTAB's authority to take action. And so the, our position is the PTAB can't have the authority to decide its own authority. That's the role of federal courts. Great, uh, so that's the setup of our, of our case. Um, let me turn to Sarv on my left here. Uh, Sarb filed an amicus brief um, uh, on the respondent side, right? And so um, tell us a little bit about why you filed a brief and also if you can give us some sense of the broader implications of this case beyond just the individuals involved in this case. Sure, so the, the, the way the Federal Circuit came to this um, this position before the case wound up in the Supreme Court 
is that a couple of years ago, uh, there was a decision, a panel decision, in a case called Wi-Fi One versus Broadcom, in which the question of whether the one-year time bar is judicially reviewable or not was decided. And the Federal Circuit panel said it is not reviewable because there's already a panel decision on the books, a case reference publishing from two years prior to that, that said no judicial review. Wi-Fi One was then uh, reheard on banc by the entire Federal Circuit. And the on banc court held that uh, judicial review does apply. And the, the main difference between, um, between the panel decision and the, the rehearing on banc, and in fact, between a Cates and Wi-Fi One, is that the Supreme Court decided uh, Quozo, which was the first uh, decision by the court on the scope of the, the judicial reviewability of these, of these findings, right? So Amanda is exactly right that 314D says that, uh, that there's no judicial review of the institution decision. It says any determination whether to institute is final and non-appealable. The thing that's final and non-appealable, the, uh, the statutory text says, is determination whether to institute under this section. So 314A, earlier in the same section, says um, <clears throat> that the director shall not institute unless there's a likelihood that the, the petitioner will prevail with, the, with respect to at least one claim, right? So what that means is the statute tells us, director, thou shalt not institute if, uh, excuse me, unless one of, these, uh, one of these conditions is satisfied. So a likelihood of success is a necessary condition. It's not a sufficient condition, which is to say that if the director feels, you know, there's enough here that we could, but in our discretion, we want to decline review, we can do that. That exercise of discretion is not susceptible to judicial review. And Quozo went a little bit further and said it's not just everything under this section, but things closely related to it. So other statutes in the IPR scheme that are closely related to the question of whether to institute are off the table for judicial review. Now, 315B, one-year time bar, is another statute. And the question is, is it closely related? And in order to get there, we have one more data point from the Supreme Court, which last year decided uh, SAS Institute versus Matal. And in that case, the court said that there was judicial review on the question of whether the, the PTAB could institute on some claims, but not all of the claims. It used to be that um, you know, the, the initial understanding of, of the PTAB statute, just on its face, was you either grant review on everything or grant review on nothing. The PTAB rules, when the USPTO created its rules package, said, yeah, we can do a full denial or a full institution, but we can also do a partial and, you know, one, part of this and part of that. That's what the court in SAS Institute said was impermissible. And in order to reach that f conclusion, they had to first decide that it was um, was judicially reviewable. And so the question for us systemically is, does Quozo control this case? Or does Quozo get sufficiently modified by SAS that we need to sort of look more deeply at, uh, at what the power of the courts is vis-a-vis -vis the power of the, of the agency? And as we'll, we'll talk about the, today's argument, a lot of the, the questions that were really at the forefront of the SAS Institute case had to do with separation of powers, the, the sort of power of the administrative state and the power of the courts to, to check that. And, uh, and those, a lot of those same questions were, were present today. And I will, I will actually pick up, you know, right, right where you left off. Is um, I think what's interesting about this today's today's um, argument in this case is it really is located within kind of the broader um, Supreme Court approach to questions of reviewability, particularly reviewability of agency decisions. And the Supreme Court, even though it recently has really refashioned itself into a Supreme Court of patent appeals, taking some four or five cases per year. Whereas when, when I clerked um, on the court, there was, there was rarely a patent case that would actually appear on the court's docket. But when court takes those cases, it really approaches them uh, typically as kind of traditional questions, uh, cases involving questions of statutory interpretation, involving questions of separation of powers, involving questions of kind of systemic relationships between um, the courts and, uh, and the agencies. And I think in this case, um, that that dynamic was in was evident even at the federal circuit stage. So when um, when the click to call panel had the case um, 
they, in fact, what's interesting is they initially held that there's under then binding Supreme Court precedent, there was no reviewability of the time bar decisions. But two of the judges wrote separately saying that while they're bound by prior panel precedent, they actually think that the traditional presumption in favor of reviewability suggests that the prior case was wrongly decided and they called for an en banc review um, in a kind of somewhat unusual circumstance when the panel majority believes that, in fact, they are signing on to a, um, to in generally a wrong result. And uh, I think for the Supreme Court also, the, uh, this case raises this, this dilemma, this question, how much... Um, how much freedom to maneuver, how much uh, room actually the agency has, um, and how much does the court have, you know, have authority to scrutinize the agency's decision. In other words, there is a general presumption that the court, um, a court will review agency's decisions unless Congress very clearly indicates otherwise. And so the court, I think, in this case, uh, is looking both at the question of um, the, uh, the statutory language in the American Vance Act and in section, in section 314 and in section 315, and asks itself a question, is this language so clear that it precludes review of these initial time bar um, decisions, similar to the way that review was precluded um, in COASA? Or is this a case where the presumption of in favor of reviewability and the notion that the time bar is phrased as a as a limitation on the board's statutory authority and on the director's statutory authority to institute an IPR, does that actually modify the language and indicate that, in fact, Congress did not clearly require uh, or did not clearly mandate uh, non-reviewability of those decisions? And so I think as we move to discuss the argument itself, I think, the, um, at least in my mind, uh, this is really what the justices were grappling with. Great. Um, so let's turn to the argument itself. Um, it wasn't clear which way, it, it wasn't a 9-0 uh, bench today. Uh, the justices were all over the map. Um, what, I'll throw it out to the panel at large, what in general struck you about the argument today uh, that the justices were wrestling with? Um, did, you, did you think they were, uh, were you surprised how they came out um, for one side or against one side? Uh, what were your opinions uh, of the argument today? So I'll go ahead and say that if you if you read the briefing in this case, the respondent focused pretty heavily in this brief on two things. One being um, when uh, when in our briefs we had laid out um, the quoso standard, which is you know it bars review of anything that's closely related to institution decision. And then throughout his brief, the respondent referred to that as petitioner's proposal, which when it is in fact what what quoso said. And so there, there's a little bit of, um, I think, on their side, trying to understand what exactly it is that respondent was saying is or is not reviewable in light of what Quozo says. Um, and then I, I think the other thing that that brief focused on was the under this section language, which you had referenced earlier. And I was actually kind of struck that there, there wasn't very much questioning on that. Um, and part of it may be that the earlier decisions, like Cade's, kind of struck that down and said the under the section inquiry um, is, is not just saying it's under this section, therefore it has to be 314, isn't right. And I think that that's especially applicable post quozo where that was under 312, not under 314. Um, and and I, I think by the end of it, uh, one thing we had been struggling with was that sentence in SAS Institute that says, quozo says you can only review if it's the, re the patentability determination. And that's that's not quite what Quozo says because again, it referred back out to 312. And so, um, you know, I think, I can't remember who came out with it immediately first. It might have been Ginsburg that was just like, well, what about SAS? And that's kind of the dreaded question on our end because <laughs> no one's gonna look Gorsuch in the eye and say, um, excuse me, Justice Gorsuch, but you completely mischaracterized that case because we, what we really think is, you know, that that's somewhat of an incomplete discussion of what Quozo said because SAS Institute was really dealing with the final decision and the fact that the final decision didn't address every in, in every challenged claim, which is what 318, which is the uh, final decision statute, requires. And so by because it was a, a statement about institution law in a case that was about final decision, it, the fact that it wasn't a full uh, description of what Quozo said um, makes sense, but it was it was very amusing to me as someone who had kind of helped Adam, who argued on our side, understand 
well, how are we going to talk about this as being an, an incomplete understanding of the law um, to have, I think it was uh, Justice K I think it was Justice Kagan who said, was well, it just wrong? Like, did we get it wrong there? Is it just wrong? And she asked it three or four times. I think the government eventually said, yeah, it's wrong. Jonathan Ellis for the yeah, government. So that yeah, was, that was pretty was amusing on our side <laughs> because, I mean, we were try like, we don't want to tell the justices they were wrong. It's their holding. Um, so it was, it was kind of an interesting, uh, I found it very amusing, probably other people less so. <laughs> <laughs> other thoughts? Uh, I'll say that I, so Quozo says that, you know, anything under this section 314 is off the table, no judicial review, and any mine run claim that's closely related is off the table, no judicial review. But the sort of set of situations in which the opinion in Quozo, the majority opinion itself, limits itself and says, here's what we're not deciding. We're not saying that constitutional questions are unreviewable. That, of course, would be inappropriate. We're not saying that ultra vires actions outside the statutory authority of the director are judicially unreviewable. That would clearly be inappropriate. And the, the sort of other questions, the catch-all, that are sufficiently, you know, um, of, of high scope and impact or closely unrelated, things uh, uh, that are beyond the scope and impact of just institution under this section, that extend in terms of scope and impact beyond just this section would still be or could still be subject to judicial review. And I was really surprised that nobody, I mean, the phrase scope and impact never came up once in the argument today. And I really think it could have and should have. That was a big part of, of our brief um, that all of the provisions in section 315, 315A, prior civil action by the petitioner, 315B, a contemporaneous litigation, co-pending litigation in the district court, um, 315E, uh, one and two of uh, post-final written decision estoppel, both court agency estoppel, or excuse me, agency court estoppel and agency agency estoppel. So all of these, you know, what's the effect of previously being sued? What's the effect of being uh, in, involved in a co-pending litigation, and what's the effect of uh, on, on future litigations? All of these limitations are reasons why you would not be able to institute today, tomorrow, or well into the future. And all of those things create a boundary between what can happen in the court and what can happen in the agency. So when you start to mess that up as the agency, and then go into court and say, you have no appellate jurisdiction to review this question. I think it's really hard to argue that that doesn't have a scope and impact well beyond this section. Because that's clearly not just implicating the agency's power. At that point, you're necessarily, if, when you disrupt the border between the court and the agency, it's going to affect the court. By definition, it's going to, to, to disrupt what goes on in the courts. And so I think there's a really strong argument that it extends in terms of scope and impact in the language of COSO well outside just the ordinary mine run claim that uh, that Quozo was about. So I was a little surprised that that didn't come up, um, but I think the argument, you know, of course, is is still there, and, and SAS makes a good case for it, even, even on top of Quozo. Yeah, I think to pick up on something Amanda said, it, I think it's awkward for, uh, for advocates to be arguing in front of a court that just decided a similar yeah. issue twice in recent yeah, years. Yeah, two years uh, ago. Yeah. In in both cases, using somewhat loose language, right? So mm -hmm. the Quoso case also has this this uh, passage that, well, of course, this would not allow the agency to engage in shenanigans. <laughs> That's not a legal term, right? <laughs> shenanigans does not have some settled meaning in the law. And so you saw both the justices and the advocates, I think, struggle today with what does that or mean, right? Yeah. What are shenanigans? And what, uh, you know, how did this sentence and SAS Institute come to be? And, and of course, I think Justice Gorsuch was probably the one today who was most strongly on respondent side and not surprising given his view of, of agencies um, and that he wrote SAS Institute. Um, and I think Amanda's right, no one wanted to say, we think you're wrong, but finally the, the SG's office did say that. Um, something that was surprising to me um, was, I think Justice Kagan, came out um, pretty forcefully during respondents' argument um, and really kind of making the point of like, well, who cares, right? This is just a minor technicality. Some other third party might just come along and bring a, pe bring a new petition or perhaps the, you know, uh, maybe the, even the time barred party could come along and join, join a third party. You know, a third party could come along and file their own petition and then 
uh, the time barred party could just join it. So who really cares? And our brief was was trying to explain that, well, that's only because the agency has said that's how the statute should be construed. And without anyone reviewing that, we're going to be in this no man's land where you have like the wild west of time barred parties joining petitions and basically taking them over. Um, and, but obviously, she wasn't very persuaded by that. Uh, at least that was my yeah. impression. She yeah. kind of saw this all as one big technicality, um, which was surprising to me. Well, one thing that I don't know if you can tell me if you agree or not is after sitting through both the argument before ours today and our argument, um, there was a similar kind of appellate review of barred parties issue, but in the immigration front that came before ours today. I thought a lot of the justices kind of on both sides of the court, frankly, were interested in understanding, is there a line at which you're willing to say, you know, we've taken away a review of this agency decision and we're willing to say that you may get it wrong sometimes, but because we've barred it, we're just willing to live with that. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of them were interested in understanding, well, why? Because um, I think it was Justice Kagan who turned to respondent and said, okay, well, you know, you're saying that we should get all the way through, we should determine that this patent never should have been granted in the first place. It's completely invalid. And you want us to say, well, that party was time barred. And even though someone else could file an identical petition, we're going to reinstate your invalid patent and let you keep this monopoly until somebody else brings the new petition. And she said to respondent, well, you know, why? Like, why would Congress want that if that's your position? And so um, we saw similar questioning in the first case. Um, including some chuckles from Breyer's questions about like the courthouse blowing away in Katrina. Um, but uh, and, and interestingly, that's kind of the first thing Gorsuch came out of the gate with, but the interesting piece was is um, he asked, well, in the case underneath, wasn't this patent unsuccessfully challenged four separate times? Like, why should we look at this? Um, and, and that's actually not what happened in this case. That is a case that was, um, I think it was brought by Power Integrations in their amicus brief. And so it kind of shifted from this hypothetical question to being like, well, didn't that happen in this case? And that was kind of a weird um, a weird situation at the end. But I think the question kind of morphed enough that um, Adam was able to address it. But I, you know, I, I think he said what, frankly, the, the parties in the prior case were not willing to say, which is like, yes, sometimes they're going to get it wrong. But the Congress has decided that even if it's, even if they get the time bar wrong occasionally, if at the end of the day the patent shouldn't have been granted, we're willing to let a, a occasional time bar petition slip through if it means getting an invalid patent off the market. So I, I thought a lot of the justices were interested in kind of that balance. Well, I I felt by the end of the argument that at least Justice Gorsuch felt that he certainly clarified the application of the shenanigans doctrine <laughs> when he wrote SAS Institute. Uh, so I actually, had, it's always a hazardous kind of exercise to try to predict which way the court is going to go based based on the questions, um, and especially based on Justice Breyer's uh, hypotheticals. <laughs> but um, it's interesting, you know, sitting in the courtroom, you just can't, you often can't resist. And um, it seemed to me that the in some ways, the justices were lining up, you know, roughly where you expect them again, based on their prior writing and probably thinking about the, uh, the relationship between the courts and the agencies. For instance, Justice Gorsuch, uh, and to some extent Justice Alito felt very strongly that the, um, that the courts should have review power over decisions. And that chimes in with Justice what George Gorsuch wrote, wrote in, uh, in Sass Institute, uh, with Justice Alito's dissent in, in, in Cuozzo. On the other hand, uh, justices who are inclined to give a greater freedom of maneuver to administrative agencies, justices Bryan, Kagan, uh, were quite strongly on the, on the, on the opposite side. What, what's interesting to me is um, actually the justices who seem to be okay with the fact that the time bar is not going to be reviewed by the courts largely justified it on the basis that the final decision, the decision on whether or not this patent, in fact, is invalid, is judicially reviewable. So again, to them, it seemed that it is, it is OK if, the, um, if, if perhaps the decision whether or not this particular IPR proceeding could have even been brought, or whether the agency was, was wrong to, in fact, initiate, initiate the review, it's OK if courts would not be able to review that because they will at least be able to review the, the, the ultimate determination whether you're going to lose your intellectual property right at the end of the day. And I think that actually gave comfort to a lot of justices who maybe otherwise would have had some, you know, some concerns um, 
uh, some concerns about the, uh, the outcome. Two other things I found interesting. One is that uh, Justice Sotomayor, who joined Justice Alito's dissent in, uh, in Cuoza, actually seemed um, inclined to side with, um, with the petitioner. Because, and, and what she, so she, she thought that, look, either way, the court, the court may actually be precluding review of some decisions. For instance, she said, isn't it the case that if the director decides not to institute an IPR because the director would conclude that, in fact, uh, petitioner is time barred, under current federal circuit law, at least that decision is, not, is currently not reviewable because there is a holding that decisions not to institute are not reviewable. Uh, so it's interesting that she seemed, she seemed fine sort of switching to the other side of the, of the divide. And then um, the one justice who I couldn't quite place uh, based on the questions he asked, and it's the one justice who actually didn't participate in either, in either cause or SS Institute, uh, Justice Kavanaugh. And uh, I think he was the one who actually was most focused on, the, uh, on whether or not the reference to this section uh, in fact, has a lot of operative meaning. And some of the questions he asked, particularly of, um, uh, I believe, of the uh, Solicitor General, uh, or the, the uh, Assistant Solicitor General, in fact, um, tried to probe whether or not the, the court's result, the court's decision should be different because Congress used the words, this section as opposed to this chapter. And so it would be interesting to see which way he will, um, to what extent that linguistic choice will play a role in his analysis and which way he's gonna go in this case. Yeah, I mean, I similarly found it interesting the way, um, in addition to looking at this section kind of as a textualist as we understand him to be, he was interested in not only whether, you know, this section played any role on petitioner's side, but also on respondent's side when he said, well, you know, if, is, if it eventually gets looked at at the end, no one's ever really gonna challenge the institution decision because they can channel on patentability when they can challenge the final decision on patentability, they're not gonna say it shouldn't have been instituted. They're just gonna say, this is not the right final decision. So what, what operative meaning does it have from a practical standpoint? And I think several other justices started picking up on that questioning as well. So I thought that was interesting that he played that, um, or the justices in general played that, what's the meaning of under the section kind of above, against both parties, as opposed to just against petitioners as we would have expected it to be. So. I'll, I'll add one thing. I, th I think a helpful way to think about what to expect uh, when this case comes down is that this case is probably in the middle of Quozo and SAS Institute in terms of the relative balance of, uh, of the arguments for reviewability or non-reviewability. So if you take um, sort of as a starting point that Justice Breyer's majority opinion in Quozo was right, that the particularity requirement of 312A3 is very closely connected to the decision whether to institute and is sort of an ordinary thing that the agency would have to do on its way to making an institution decision just at, at the threshold, then it stands to reason that that's something we don't want to disturb uh, later on even after a final written decision has been entered. Now, SAS was way on the other end because it wasn't just what happened at the institution decision, do we institute on some versus all claims, but the patent office's position about what to do with that is to take it all the way through and say our obligation of final reason decision making, which the APA requires of us, which section 318 requires of us specifically in IPR, all of those things are cabined as well. And our discretion can reach as far as the final written decision and we get to in some sense define our own statutory responsibilities. That's what I think led from a 7-2 decision in Quozo to a 5-4 in, uh, in SAS. And SAS was certainly a, a proxy fight for Chevron because that was a big fight, uh, a big point of contention in the arguments there as well. But when you look at how the votes actually went, you have three justices who sort of held their ground from Quozo to SAS. Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer both said no appeal in Quozo, no appeal in SAS. Justice Alito said, yes, there is judicial review even in Quozo and certainly in SAS. Justice Sotomayor started with Justice Alito and said, yeah, no, uh, uh, no, um, excuse me, there is judicial reviewability, so the, the bar doesn't apply in Quozo. But having lost that fight, by the time SAS comes around, she says, okay, well, now there, there is no judicial review and the, the court's decision in Quozo has to, has to control here. So she flipped um, from, from Quozo to SAS. Now, Justice Roberts, Justice Thomas, and Justice Kennedy, who's no longer on the court, 
all were no votes in Quozo, no judicial review, but wound up as, yes, there is judicial review in SAS. And so J Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Thomas, to the extent they flipped, might still be willing to say, yes, there was judicial review in SAS, but Thrive doesn't quite get us that far. Or they might say, yeah, it's still closer to SAS than it is to Quozo. So those are two votes that are sort of up for grabs, depending on which way you think the um, the, the issues cut, right? And then uh, as far as, uh, oh, excuse me, I, I said Ginsburg and Breyer, Justice Kagan as well, uh, was a no vote in Quozo and a no vote in, in SAS. So I think Thrive's in the middle of, of those two points. And of course, I mean, we, we filed in support of the respondent, so we think that, uh, my, my colleagues and I think that judicial review should be available. But the way to think about this, um, in response to Justice Sotomayor's excellent question, about why is it that there should be judicial review if the time bar is applied to, or any you know, sort of right of review uh, in, in IPR, is applied to say there is review when there shouldn't be, a false positive. That would implicate judicial review under the standard that click to call is advancing and that you know, my, the, the amici uh, are, are supporting on, on our side. But why should it be that that's available, but a denial of institution should not be available. In other words, the director says, I've got the power to institute here, but I'm just gonna choose not to do it because I'm, whatever, politically inclined toward patent owners or something like that. I think the example we heard was, nobody over six foot two inches is, is allowed. And, um, what if you are six foot two inches? Well, then. Because I am, that's There you question. go, that's, that's exactly right. right at me when he said that. I was like, is that? Yeah. yeah. So that if, if that's the case, right, what's the difference? I think the, uh, there's a good answer to, to that excellent question, and it's that when the director declines to exercise authority that the director has and is sort of exercising less than the full remit of authority the agency has, that doesn't pose a separation of powers problem the way that it does pose a separation of powers problem if the agency overreaches. There's no constitutional problem with underreaching, but there is a constitutional problem with overreaching in the separation of power sense. And that's really what uh, these boundary policing provisions in 315A, 315B, and 315E are all about. It doesn't just say the director shall not institute unless on 314A side. It also says, regardless of what the director's discretion consists of, here are situations in which an institution simply cannot be had. And that's a much firmer you know, sort of uh, constraint on, on what the agency can do. And so it is different in kind. I think Justice Sotomayor really hit the nail on the head with that question, and, and there is a good answer to it. Great, so let me um, step out and ask a broader question before we turn over to, to questions from the audience. Um, we talked about uh, Justice Gorsuch and Justice, Justice Leo, Lito, who have a very strong view of um, administrative agencies or maybe a, a lack of strong view of administrative agencies. Um, but in the last four years, there have been a number of patent cases which all implicate greatly administrative law. Um, and Justice Gorsuch and Justice Leader are some of the most active participants in oral argument. Um, so what, what did you make of the way they approach the, this question? It's not from a, well, I, I, in the past, it's not been from a patent law perspective. They're, they're looking at this through an administrative lens. Um, do you think that's across the court? Uh, or do you think some people think this is patent-specific rules that we're making that don't have as much implication for all of administrative law? I can I can start. Um, I mean, I think I think Justice Gorsuch and Alito really look look at these cases, particularly the you know, I mean, I think they look at at SAS Institute, they look at you know this case as basically uh, raising general questions, including general questions of administrative yeah. law, and I think they approach they approach those cases you know with with that presumption. Um, I think you know for them there is um, you know what's what's also interesting is a little bit of a I think historical trajectory because you had some justices like, um, like former Chief Justice Rehnquist and uh, Justice Scalia who really were often concerned about courts overreaching and courts claiming power to review agency decisions where Congress really wanted to preclude review. And I think you know currently, and I think that view has a little bit faded currently into the background. And you have more, 
you know, the, the new members of a court like Justice Alito, Gorsuch, um, and, and Kavanaugh, um, and also Justice Thomas, I think, is in that, in that sort of uh, group, who are more concerned about actually the extension of reaching the administrative state. And so they're much more inclined to say that there has to be a judicial review authority and judicial supervision of agency decisions. So I think, you know, from that perspective, for them, really, this is, there is nothing particularly patent specific for this case. I think also if you look at the decision in, in SAS Institute, I think one striking issue there, at least to me, was that the justice in dissent really viewed it as a little bit more of a patent specific case. And they were concerned about the, uh, the, the questions of policy and the questions of rationality. Why would Congress set up a system where the board could only institute on all claims or none, even if at the end, you know, it will only decide just a few, you know, claims uh, unpatentable, but not others. Uh, whereas I think, therefore, for the majority, including for Justice Gorsuch, this was just a question of statutory interpretation and judicial review and uh, Chevron deference, even though the court didn't reach that question. Um, so I think, I think maybe on the other side of the question, some other justices are thinking about it as not necessarily that this is a really patent-specific issue, but they're thinking, well, what's the appropriate policy? Um, I think you see <coughs> that in, you saw that a lot in Justice Kagan's questions that we already discussed. Um, and actually, um, Amanda, you brought up a point that Justice Kavanaugh also asked, well, why would Congress design a system where the only questions for which review would be barred would be the questions that you're not going to seek review on? from the final written de uh, decision, from the final decision of the PTAP. So I think there are, there are justices who are thinking, look, in terms, of, in terms of policy, in terms of functionality, what would be the right result here, given the way that the, uh, that the PTAP adjudicates those cases? So let me suggest this. I, I, I think SAS was very clearly, I mean, when you go back and read the cert petition, it was not pitched as a patent case. It was pitched very much as an admin law case. And the timing with Justice Gorsuch's you know, sort of uh, membership on the bench was, was a little bit lucky um, because his skepticism as, as a circuit judge of, about Chevron was, was you know, sort of widely known. I think this situation and Justice Kavanaugh's question, you know, is the statute ambiguous or not? And I think Petitioner's counsel during rebuttal made a really good firm, no, it is not. That's, and, and that's the position that you know, would, would be appropriate uh, to take for that, uh, for that argument. I think the ambiguity is really going to drive a lot of this because in Chevron, if you know, the sort of quote-unquote conservative wing of the court, if you, if you like using crude terms like that, um, are, are inclined to take a more textualist view of whether step one of Chevron can in fact be dispositive. A textualist is more likely to say all the tools of statutory construction and interpretation will get us the answer uh, a fair amount of the time. And at that point, it's unnecessary to go into the reasonableness of what the agency did. In the same way, this isn't a case about Chevron, but if the statute is relatively ambiguous, then you haven't given us the clear indications that are necessary to overcome the presumption in favor of judicial reviewability. And I think this case absolutely will have impacts outside of, of patent law, and it's designed to have impacts outside of patent law. Because in Quozo and Sass, we had all this discussion of mock mining and Lindahl, which are cases from you know, different areas of the law, and we're, we're using those to resolve a patent law question. There's no reason to expect, I think, that this case, once it's decided, will not also become part of that, that body of cases that other areas of the administrative state will look to. So I think there will be a patent-specific and patent policy-specific outcome, and the court, the justices will probably be sensitive to that, but there's no reason to think that this will be, you know, an admin law decision just for the patent system. I think it will be designed and written in a way that uh, that should apply outside. So uh, just as a, a question for, you know, kind of the, the respondent side who sees the statute as ambiguous, mm -hmm. what did you make of the argument that the text of 314D is different from three former 312 and 303C, mm -hmm. kind of in a meaningful way, where instead of saying there shall be no review of the decision in to institute under a particular subsection mm -hmm. rather than the whole institution section, particularly in light of the fact that 314B 
refers out to the rest of the chapter. So the section under which institution happens mm -hmm. and under which the decision is made is what's not reviewable. But 314D says you got to look at the time bar. You got to look at the particularity. You got to look at whether the fee's been paid, right? So those are all things that are raised, both that can be raised in the response that have mm -hmm. to be considered. So the idea that just from even if you're looking at this section as meaning 314 yeah. um, and it's restricted to that, doesn't 314 mandate consideration of the other pieces of the chapter so that would all get rolled in? That's a great question. I, I think that uh, the, yeah. the sort of way to think about it is what the en banc federal circuit did during its arguments in Wi-Fi 1. The, um, the sort of Presumption in favor of reviewability was overcoming Quozo. There's no doubt about that, right? In SAS, they went back to square one and said, okay, now you have to overcome that presumption of reviewability again as to the you know, obligation of final written decision making. And in that situation, you didn't. So it gives us two data points, but more importantly, it tells us that every single time you want something else to be swept into the, the ambit of what's unreviewable under 314D, you have to make that case again. And making that case again with respect to 315B requires you to go back and answer that same set of questions from Quozo. Is it closely related or does it extend in scope and impact beyond uh, just, I mean, it's sort of a flavor of the major questions doctrine, right? I think that's what I would sort of use as the starting point. But doesn't the, just as a follow-up, doesn't the, as you said, SAS Institute was dealing with, you know, have you overcome the presumption for final written decision, but 319 governs appeal of final written decisions, not 314, which says you can review those, right? Yeah, so, well, I, let me go back to, to, your, to your first question, which I think was actually two questions. The first being the difference between the former articulation, which was under subsection A, and then the change to under this section. I wasn't terribly persuaded by that because I think it's still a half measure, meaning there still was a much clearer way that Congress w could have made it even clearer, which would have been to say under this chapter. And the, under this section, it seemed to be like a half measure, but I'm not sure it got you all the way to being clear enough. The, their, their second point was what about the fact that 314B you know, reaches out beyond section mm -hmm. 314? And, and I was surprised mm -hmm. that there wasn't more discussion of that point today because that was a point that I thought was a, a good one and, and that troubled me um, coming into the argument today. And I didn't, I was surprised justice didn't do more with that. Um, but to me, that was, that particular point was more compelling than just the mere switch from under A to this section. Great. Um, so do we have any questions uh, from our audience? If not, no, Mike. Well, I, um, can I take you back to the, um, I found it a little odd. I guess it is that SAS really just, it really reads like a throwaway line. Like in Quozo we said, and I'm going to drop in the word only when, as lawyers, we know we should never say that something only, says something only, unless we're completely sure. <laughs> um, so I, I recognize the awkwardness, but if you flip the argument and say, yes, SAS is now the last word on what we held in Quozo. It was a holding in Quozo. This was the dicta in SAS describing Quozo, but it, it occupied a fair amount of the argument. And so, and there did seem to be some sense of, well, normally we don't do this, but it might be useful to pretend as if SAS actually changed the meaning of Quozo. Um, which is not normally how we refine our precedents, but there, can I just understand why there was more traction to that discussion than to me it seems like there ought to have been? Um, so, I mean, in our opinion, I think it's because, frankly, it pretty squarely contradicts what, what we're saying should be done in this case, right? And so the question is, it, isn't this dispositive? And to which, of course, our answer is no for a couple of reasons, one being there is nothing in SAS or SAS um, that says we are trying to change what Quozo said because that would fundamentally change the meaning of Quozo because Quozo said you cannot review a 312 particularity decision. But then SAS said that Quozo said you can only not review 314, everything else is reviewable. So there would have had to been a much clearer statement by the Supreme Court that said we're completely 
not only are we changing our holding, we're basically reversing the decision and that has to be redone now. And there wasn't that there. And, you know, and the second piece was, as I alluded to earlier, that that wasn't really a 314 decision because they decide whether to institute or not to institute. There's no kind of we have to institute. And then the issue was, well, now that I've appealed the final written decision under 319 and said, or I used 319 to appeal the 318 final written decision and said, hey, you can't do this. Um, you can't just make a decision on half the claims. You have to make them on all of them. So it really was dealing with an entirely different statute, which I think um, at the end, Justice Kagan actually very neatly articulated um, kind of what we were getting at there with how um, how those two things can be kept separate. And it do, it's not really fatal because it, the, in, the decision in SAS didn't really rely on that, um, which I was real happy with. <laughs> so so I, I don't view them as that contradictory. And I think it often is the case that the Supreme Court decides an opinion like Quoso, which itself has lots of ambiguous kind of throwaway lines, and the court comes back to it a few years later, and sometimes, you, in this case, you have new members of the court, um, or sometimes you have one member who rereads it and, and thinks about the case differently in light of the new issue bef before them. And, um, and the court sometimes takes the opportunity to, to try to to reshape that prior decision um, because the current, you know, five members of the court are not happy with how it came out. Um, and so uh, it would not surprise me if that is what Justice Gorsuch was doing with that line and was was basically saying, yeah, it's gotta be some, it's gotta be 314A or these, you know, minor things that really are informing the decision under 314A, such as is the petition sufficiently particular, which is a, which informs whether the director has enough information to make that 314A analysis. And so I, I think that's probably what Gorsuch was doing. I don't think it's, he just, he mistakenly put the word only in the decision. I doubt that all the law clerks just missed that word and all the justices missed that word. Um, but the question now is, you know, are the other members of that five Justice majority going to stick with it, and the chief I thought was was the one most likely to to vote with the other side today based on his questioning. So uh, we'll just have to see how how that shakes out. And it also, I mean, that's it's a subject of debate whether or not it was a mistake or whether it was deliberate. Because I mean, I think I think again the you know Justice Gorsuch, who was not member of course, could have thought, look, I I in fact, and the other four just agreed with him. I want to constrain cause a bit. Uh, because I think it's important to actually remember what the um, SAS Institute majority put on the other side of the ledger, because the, the court decision there said the, the structure, the questions whether the, the board and the PTO complied with the structural limits on its authority should be reviewable. So I think, you know, that, that was kind of the way that, at least in my reading, that's how SAS Institute was trying to reformulate COOSA to say, look, there are some discretionary decisions, and it's really, you know, maybe just these two, you know, in terms of whether or not there is reasonable probability of, you know, patentability issues. And then there are structural limits, and such structural limits which are phrased in mandatory term, uh, such as the time bar, which is what we just, of course, emphasized at the argument today, those questions actually would be reviewable. So, I mean, I, I agree with Amy. It's, um, you know, there is often this dynamic in the court's jurisprudence where a subsequent decision tries to reinterpret the prior decision in, in perhaps a somewhat different light than the original decision really meant. Great. Uh, other questions for Ian? <coughs> Follow up. Mike. <laughs> okay. um, I did not understand. So, so if the, 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 as Justice Gorsuch was pushing on, you know, the... Um, basically the bad faith director, right? The director acting in completely uh, ultra vires, I would think, but he didn't want the, his hypothetical to. Um, and, and he was told, don't worry, the courts can get involved if the administrative agency is that outrageous through mandamus. And then he was saying, well, under what procedure, under what uh, sort of jurisdictional hook do, do you bring a, a claim for mandamus? And I myself didn't, feel like he got an answer. So can someone help me? Like, what, if you want non-reviewability here, how does mandamus protect us against the rogue director? 
Sure. So pages nine through eleven of the transcript, the you know, the requirement for mandamus. One of the requirements for mandamus is you don't have ordinary access to judicial review. So not only would this not be fatal, not only would three fourteen not be fatal, it would actually be a requirement. Before you ever ask for mandamus, you would have to demonstrate all other avenues are closed. And then in other contexts, the uh, the question in, in response to Justice Sotomayor. Oh, sorry, just can I, so the relief you'd ask from is you go to the federal circuit yeah. asking for an order directing the director to institute. Or not institute, or, depending on what the nature of the egregious conduct okay, was. Which parties if, have done, or at least tried to do frequently. Right. Uh, frequently is not the right word, but so yeah, but times, I mean, like Dominion yeah. Dealer in the early cases of the Federal Circuit immediately Bates, post, yeah. right? Yeah, so these these cases would come up on mandamus right after or contemporaneously with what turned out to be a three fourteen D appeal. So they'd say, "We'd like to ask for a review, please," and they'd say, "No, three fourteen D says you can't." Um, CBM, meanwhile, you know, they said, "In this case, you can," and and so that was a different uh, sort of interpretation on, on one side of the, the PTAB than the other. But basically, if you couldn't get a review because 314D or 324 um, uh, forbade it, you could still get mandamus review. And for that matter, you could get a um, an, an APA action, just an ordinary uh, APA action for judicial review saying that this is contrary to law, arbitrary and capricious, and, and so on down the line. So it's not as if there would be no relief. And it, it sort of cuts both ways. The you know, errant director who's out to harm patent owners or the errant director who's out to unduly sort of favor patent owners uh, at the expense of, of technology implementers, they're both protected through these safety valves. And it will be rare because mandamus is an extraordinary remedy and it shouldn't be granted lightly, but that's entirely consistent with the sort of assumption that I think is reasonable that the PTO is not going to screw up very often. So it won't be necessary except in rare <coughs> situations. A question about that actually. I mean, it'd be one thing if the statute said a direct appeal shall be limited to these issues, right? And the, mm -hmm. and this was outside the scope of that. Then I could see an argument that yes, you should bring mandamus or you could bring mandamus. But when the statute says cannot be reviewed, why would that not? I'm just, I don't know. I, I don't know the law on this issue, but why would that not apply to bar a mandamus review or an APA action? Well, it so it says final and not, it doesn't say non-reviewable, it says non-appealable. And so shall be final and non-appealable is in some sense redundant if what we're talking about is a denial of institution. Because if it's denied, what work is final doing, right? It's only when what would otherwise be perceived as an interlocutory opportunity for review, the institution has been granted, should not have been granted, and now the patent owner is being deprived of their right not to stand trial in the sort of 12b6 sense, right? Um, and I think it was interesting that, that Twombly and Iqbal came up in the decision, in the, the argument today, because it is a, a reasonable analogy to this. There is a right not to stand trial under certain circumstances, one of which I think is embodied in, in 315b, but it's not appealable uh, in those other situations. And so uh, I think mandamus would operate sort of outside of that, that narrow grounds for, for traditional. Well, mandamus is an appeal, not a, a writ, not an appeal, right? right. It's so it's just a mo an order. Yeah. Right. It's a writ, and in fact, it was, I think it was actually the, um, the parties and cause itself at mm -hmm. the federal circuit level also sought, sought a writ of mandamus as an alternative to right. the general appeal. And what was somewhat odd uh, in the majority opinion on Quasa, the, the Federal Circuit actually said, uh, and obviously it's, it's a little bit, you know, what our bridge now said, well, the writ of mandamus potentially may be available, but not actually right after the institution. It will be available only, you know, from the, you know, after the final written decision, which in some way it's, it's actually doesn't really chime in with the notion of mandamus, which is the idea is that you cannot wait. You not right. only do you not have a way to get a remedy for organ repeal, but also there is really no, there is no reason to wait to, you know, to consider this determination. So I think actually this, if the Supreme Court decides um, against reviewability in, uh, in this case, I think you may see some sort of refinement of when mandamus you know, may or may not be available. Great. Um, we're ready at 6 o'clock. So with that, we'll uh, thank the panel um, for the great panel. And we have a reception, I believe, out in the foyer. Um, and so thank you for coming. Thanks, man. Thanks. Good. I see you. Yeah. That was great. Thank you.
Things me. I didn't. Uh, I didn't have my so, uh, form. What? Form? Busy. Yeah, I'm not really into How long have you been there? Uh, Twenty years. Oh. Yes, Estonian, right? So. So. It's fine. Yeah. It's no big deal. So, uh, you were first one. So I'm trying to listen here. Yeah. 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 And you were talking about. I got to plan out what I can. Deep diving. Through archives. I'm going. Yeah. You seem to have a deep background. Yes. Hey. Hey. How's it going? Stream team. Yeah. Yeah. Just going. I mean, I'm halfway done the finals, having only done one so far. So that's cool. Public affairs director. Your second third. Right. So if you want to figure out what. The original. <laughs> this year, that's the only one I have left, and I will literally right. pick up the right. It's just a writing. It's like an hour.